So welcome to the Brave, Bold, Brilliant podcast. I'm your host, Jeanette Linfoot. I am here today with someone that I have known for many years in the travel industry. He's a multiple business owner. He's a non-exec director in a travel business called Arena Travel, but he's also an investor and shareholder in that business. So I am delighted to welcome Ian Brooks to the podcast. Ian. And I am delighted and very excited to be here. <laughs> I love it. Ian, you always just ooze energy and I, I really love it when we spend time together. So it's a, a great opportunity to get to know you more and for our listeners to hear all about your journey and your story. So should we just dive in there, Ian? Give us a, give us a heads up about your life and uh, how, how things have panned out for you and then we're going to go from there. Well, I think this is going to be one of the biggest challenges in my career, actually, Jeanette, because you said... Uh, uh, I've got five minutes to go through this. And um, as, as you know, I'm quite old, so there's quite a lot to say, but I'll do my best. Um, I think I think family um, and your surroundings uh, and environment are quite an influence on you at an early age. Um, my parents and my family uh, were all from Manchester, which I know is an important place in your heart and where you are right now. Um, and I think that those sort of northern roots had quite an influence um, on me, although I was actually raised uh, in the south. Um, my granddad on my mum's side was a big influence. Um, he was really into football. He got me into football, into Man United. He taught me how to play cards. He taught me how to light a coal fire. Um, he loved going to pubs and taking me into pub gardens, etc. So he had quite an early influence on my life. Um, but I actually grew up in, in kind of boring northwest London suburbia. Um, and I went to a sort of pretty rough and intimidating comprehensive school. Um, but I formed, formed some really important friendships there uh, and those people are still um, close friends in my life. I was pretty average um, at school. I mean, sort of probably above average, but I wasn't particularly academic. Um, I applied to go to university just because that's what my mates did. And um, I, I desperately wanted to go to Manchester University because um, that's what my family uh, were, were mainly from. And, and I knew it meant I could get three seasons of watching Man United play. Um, so I really wanted to go to Manchester University and um, the teachers told me that I wouldn't get the grades to get there. And um, that was probably motivation enough for me to, uh, to, to, to really work hard and, and study hard because uh, I wasn't brilliant academically. Um, but I got the grades, so I got to go, which is great. I studied sort of business studies and management. And quite frankly, it was... You know, it was three of the best years of my life, but I learned very little off the course. It was too academic. I think, you know, business is not particularly academic. Most of the lectures are really boring, apart from um, one from the university chancellor, who is called Professor Roland Smith. Um, and at the time, he was uh, he was quite a kind of a big hitter in, in industry. He was at the time he was chairman of uh, House of Fraser. Um, more important for me, he was chairman of Manchester United. Um, but he came and gave a lecture, which is the best lecture I ever had. And there was no theory and there was no sort of business books. It was just all about, you know, what really happens in the world of business. And he talked about takeover deals and, uh, and, and, and stuff like that. And it really, it really got me excited. And I thought, yeah, I, I want to be involved in business. Um, when I, when I came to leave, um, you know, you did, you do the sort of milk round jobs and stuff. And I sort of had, uh, three potential opportunities. I had one was with, um, a paper manufacturing business that made, made the, the pound notes for the bank of England. Um, the second one was, uh, with, with was with a brewery. Uh, and the third one was, was with a travel business. I really wanted the job with the brewery. Um, but I blew it at the third interview because um, they took you to their management center and it was two days of assessment. And it was, of course, it was free beer on the last night. And uh, I, I, I fell down the trap. You know, they obviously, it was the trap that was set. And of course, I was a student, it's free beer. I mean, what else are you going to do? So I didn't get that. Um, so it's between that and the travel business, uh, the travel business and the paper business. And paper sounded a bit dull. So I joined um, ILG in Sun Holidays uh, group, as which you know well. Um, and people who are of our, our generation will know. Um, it was a very entrepreneurial business. I learned loads um, and, and it was a very fast paced business. And um, after, after four years there, I joined their airline Air Europe, which for me was really the precursor of, of the low cost airlines. Um, Harry Goodman was a real visionary, a real entrepreneur. <clears throat> and if it wasn't for the fact that the airline industry wasn't deregulated at that time, 
um, he would have been more successful. But as we know, sadly, um, the first Gulf War um, saw off mm. ILG. It went bust, uh, which was very sad. Um, but uh, I got a taste for traveling that role. And I had probably one of the best, best jobs I think I've ever done in my life um, when I was uh, made international sales manager for Air Europe. And my job was to basically... I got to fly all around the US and, and all around Asia and, and do deals, interline deals with other airlines to feed traffic onto Air Europe's network at, at, at Gatwick. So um, that that was a great a great job. But yeah, sadly came to an end. But I managed to um, to, to get a three month consultancy contract at Virgin Atlantic um, after that, and uh, 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 that turned into a permanent role. At the time, Virgin only had operated three routes to New York, Miami, and Orlando, and was only based at Gatwick. So it's a pretty small airline. Um, I got to work for a guy called Paul Griffiths, who um, was quite a big influence on me, one of the brightest guys I've ever, ever worked for. Um, Paul's, Paul's currently a CEO of um, uh, Dubai, Dubai Airports, um, but he's a super, super bright guy. Um, but I also got to... Um, I got to develop my career quite so quickly because it was a small airline and it was growing and um, I was still under 30 and I was appointed the general manager of the commercial department. So I was responsible for all the pricing, the aircraft selection, the new routes, et cetera. Um, and I got a lot of exposure to Richard Branson, um, which was quite exciting. Um, and then I, I, after doing that for a couple of years, um, I got moved, moved to run the sales team um, with 50 staff under me. And um, and again, you know, a lot of access to 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 uh, Romeo Bravo, as we used to call him, or um, or the beard and the teeth, um, because it's essentially the 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 money you you make out of running a, an airline like Virgin Atlantic is all driven by the front cabin, and it's all about the upper class sales and upper class, and that was basically um, down to selling to the investment banks in the city, and, and Richard had clout with them, so. Um, I got a lot of exposure um, to Richard, which was which was really fantastic uh, for me, and I, I you know I learned a lot watch, watching him. Um, Virgin invested in Eurostar, which was uh, new and exciting at the time, and uh, I was encouraged to take a two year secondment there um, as a commercial director, looking after sales and marketing. Um, it was a great opportunity, um, but working with state. Uh, owned uh, partners, SNCF and SNCB, wasn't for me. And decisions uh, made by committee are not great for business, I can tell you that. I agree. Um, Branson wanted to get into um, the European holiday market um, and he wanted Virgin Holidays to develop a, a Mediterranean beach um, programme. So he asked me to, to head up this, this new business and um, effectively did a startup um, with a new brand called Virgin Sun, and we launched a small airline with four A320s uh, and we set up a, a brand new Mediterranean um, tour operator. Um, and it was probably one of the toughest jobs I've, I've ever done. Uh, but in 18 months, uh, we started from business plan to, uh, to, to launch the business. Big, big story in the press, took all the, flew all the press um, out to Mallorca. Uh, all very exciting. Um, however, the internet hadn't really quite taken off at that point in time. And the sales of, of, of holiday, holidays, of beach holidays, were dominated by the big four agency chains, um, which were owned by Tui Air Tours, First Choice, and and um, and, and Thomas Cook, uh, and they were determined not to let Virgin into that uh, all important Mediterranean mm -hmm. beach holiday market. So our distribution was strangled, uh, and and essentially after a couple of years, you know, the business um, was closed out, was sold sold to First Choice. So it was probably the first sort of failure um, that I'd experienced in my life. Um, but, but wow, what a learning. Um, after that, I think it was one of the um, investment bankers at Goldman Sachs uh, advised Richard Branson that um, the internet was going to be the next big thing. And if he put .com on the end of the name Virgin, uh, he'll, be, he'll become a billionaire again, you know, once over. Um, at that point in time, you know, not a lot was known about the internet and it was kind of seen as a, a separate business as opposed to just a distribution platform. Um, so Richard set up a business called Virgin.com um, and I was asked to be uh, the managing director of uh, Virgin.com Travel, uh, which is essentially a, a, an OTA, an online travel agency with a Virgin name. And um, so this was such fun. And um, I, I sort of, you know, we were well-funded. We had a great brand, or so we thought we did. Um, and I could set up 
um, this this business um, and 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 choose my management team. Uh, and wow, what a management team! So I got a guy called Andy Owen Jones um, as sort of um, as as sort of chief operating officer and in, and, and in charge of of, of tech. Um, he's he he went on to found uh, BD for travel, uh, a very successful um, entrepreneur uh, in tech. Um, I had Ed, Ed Sims, who's currently CEO of uh, Jet West. He he was running marketing. Um, and I found this mad Greek guy called uh, Yanis or John Kent um, to to come and run sales for me. Um, and uh, so we, we, it was a fantastic time, and we set this business up, and we hired about a hundred people, and we got a we got to start a call center and everything. And there was just one problem, um, which was that uh, the rights to the Virgin name to sell travel sat with uh, Virgin Atlantic and Virgin Holidays. Um, and Richard had just sold a 49% stake in that Singapore Airlines for £600 million. Pounds. Um, and they had the right to use the Virgin name to sell travel. Well, we needed it as well as uh, under virgin.com. And um, there was a big legal battle, et cetera, which is a bit weird between two different Virgin companies. Um, but essentially, um, we weren't allowed to uh, to trade under the Virgin name. So... Um, we said, well, we've got all these staff, what we're going to do with them. So we started trading under a name Package Holidays Direct. And um, we put it on, on the internet. Um, we had a call center. We got some great deals. John Kemp was brilliant at getting the deals. And we started trading and we were doing quite well. Um, anyway, final agreement came from from uh, from Richard from the top to say, look, I'm really sorry, guys, but I'm going to have to kind of close you down or, or move you into the airline because they've got the rights to the Virgin name. So you can't really carry on, I'm afraid. Um, and that was, that was my ch- chance. That was my time. Um, I was offered another role, um, which I turned down. I was offered a chance to run. They were launching a new business, um, which, which I, I didn't think was, was going to be any good. It's called trainline.com. Um, and I thought, well, trains are a bit boring and how can you make money selling like train tickets? I mean, they're pretty low value. Um, what did I know? So I turned that one down and um, I, uh, I left and uh, took some, some, a redundancy package and um, I left with, with John Kent, um, who was my sales director, and we set up um, our own business. We set up a business called Travel Bargains and we got some backing um, from some, uh, some wealthy Greek guys that John knew. Um, and, and we launched uh, basically a, a call centre um, selling discounted holidays. And, um, and then 9-11 hit. And, uh, you know, the phones stopped ringing instantly. Um, and, you know, what the hell do you do? Christ. Um, so... The thing was, John had lots of connections in Greece. All the Greek hoteliers on the phone to him saying, John, Yanis, what are we going to do? Our hotels are going to be empty. Um, so he got these amazing deals from them. And we had five-star hotels at the same price, but the big boys like Tui and Thomas Cook were selling their two-star self-catering accommodation. Um, and they had to sell that because they're committed to it. So they were selling two weeks in Lanzarote for 199. We were selling two weeks in uh, Crete in a five-star hotel on half board for 199. We were doing brilliantly. We suddenly people weren't afraid of flying when the price was that good, the deal was that good. Um, and then there was a kind of critical moment. All of our friends in the travel industry were saying, "How come you're doing so well?" And we're well, we've got access to these great deals. And they were saying, well, we, can we have access? And we were like, oh, do we give it to them or, or do we just keep it to ourselves? And anyway, big decision, which I think we got right. We said, no, actually, let's create another vehicle called medhotels.com and let's distribute it um, to other travel businesses and make a markup, markup on it. Um, we did that. And the business, from a standing start, we grew it from nothing to 35 million in three years. So it was, it was a hell of a journey. Um, we did a we did a VC deal with with Barclays, um, and, and we sold after three years to LastMinute.com. Uh, we sold way too early, way too soon. But hey, you know what did we know right then? You know that was the first time we'd had our own business. Um, I mean, since then I've been involved in eight different startups. 
Um, some have gone on to good things, some haven't. Um, I've invested in a specialist tour operator, as you mentioned at the beginning, arena travel. And I've just started uh, doing a few uh, non-exec roles as well, which is, uh, which is quite interesting. So uh, that's my story. Fantastic. Well, there's so much in there, isn't there? God, it's, it, I mean, I knew, uh, I knew a fair bit of that, Ian, but I've actually learned a lot as well through, through that um, canter through. But um, I want to come back, actually, to where you started, um, which was really about, you, you were saying about your family being from Manchester, good northern roots, yeah. the influence that your granddad had on you. How did your childhood and sort of how you grew up your younger years influence you in your later later years as a business person, would you say? So I, I, I'll probably take two, two things from that, um, Jeanette. One is um, sort of a, a degree of adversity. Not, I mean, I, my, I had very loving parents and that was great and, and they were very supportive. So that was, I think it's important. Um, I was quite small at school um, and, you know, I went to pretty rough ass comprehensive. There's a bit of bullying went on there. You had to learn to be sort of quite resilient. You know, we didn't have mental health in those days, you know, you just had to sort of get on with it. Yeah. Um, uh, I suspect I was dyslexic. Um, I've never actually been um, tested. My daughter's um, uh, quite severely dyslexic, um, was, was diagnosed at an early age. Um, and, um, yeah, I've always had to work hard, you know, uh, to achieve things academically. So I think, you know, I think that is still for me a hard work ethic, um, and, and a degree of resilience. Um, I think the second thing is I was an only child and, um, when you're an only child, you, you have to go out and make friends because otherwise you're on your own and it's a bit boring and it gets lonely. So I, I, I think, you know, I, um, I'm always keen to meet people and um, I like making connections. Um, I like building relationships. Mm. And I think that in, in business, you know, for me, um, I think my network is really important to me. People I've met along the way that have helped me, um, business partners, etc. So I think that's, that stems from my childhood, that being an only child, having to force myself to go out and meet people, make friends. Yeah, well, that, I mean, look, there's some brilliant examples there where you can see how those aspects have, have really gone and ran as a thread through your entire business life, really, um, in terms of the, the, the opportunities you've had and how you've grabbed them. And you made me laugh, actually, that well, when you said one of your teachers said, you know, you wouldn't get the grades and that just that sod that, I am going to get the grades and I am going to make this happen, almost prove that person wrong. Um, so has that happened a few times in your career, Ian, where you've just thought, no way, I'm not accepting that. I am, I'm going to ignore the naysayers. Uh, and you get, we all get them, don't we? People that tell us no or you're not good enough. Um, you know, that has that kicked in a number of times in your career, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I wouldn't say that I'm 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 stubborn. I think you know, I think that there are um, there can be some negative connotations of of that kind of like sod you attitude. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say I take it to to, to great extreme, but um, there there is something nice about I I, I love um, breaking the status quo. I, I I love I love it if you can find a new way of of doing things and a new way of um, making things work. I, th I think that's, um, that, that definitely motivates me. Um, and certainly, you know, in, in my career at times, sometimes you know, things don't go well for you or you get the wrong boss or you're in the wrong mm. part of the business and you just think, how did I end up here? Uh, <laughs> I, 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 but you just got to stick at it. You know, you got to stick at it and, and and I think it it, it can come good. And and I'm also I'm, I'm I'm a great believer in the long game. Um, although I've got a short attention span, I get bored easily. I'm a great believer in the in the in the long game. And you know, people say, well, why did you invest in that? And then actually you stick with it, and 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 it will come good. Um, I, I think that's I've seen that quite a few times. Um, mm. And I've had some bad business in, investments and. Um, I've invested quite a lot in property. I know you're into you're into property a lot now, um, yeah. Jeanette. And um, you now I've invested in some properties which I've 
you know, there's been no logic to it. It's just been an area that I've lived in. And <laughs> I was like, I'll, I'll buy a flat here or buy a house here. And, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes it, 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 it goes badly um, for, for a long time, but then it, eventually it comes good. And um, I bought first bought house I bought was a, a place in Hamwell in, in West London, which is still sort of one of the less gl- glamorous places in, in West London. And, you know, was, was that a good investment or not? But you know what? Um, the new Elizabeth line, uh, Crossrail, uh, one of the stops is going to be Hamwell. So, so the same guy that I, that I rented that house out at in back in the early nineties, he still runs a rent letting agency there and we talk and stuff. And he said to me, Ian, he said, don't sell it. Don't sell it. He said, hang on to it, you know, because Crossrail's come in, it's going to go up in value. Well, that's a great example of playing the long game and hopefully that'll, uh, that'll come good. It's interesting what you say, actually, Ian, because I think um, it's quite unusual for entrepreneurs uh, to, all, to, do, to play the long game. Because very often, as you said yourself, you know, you're, you're, you get easily bored, you know, the shiny penny kicks in, I think, with entrepreneurs and you think, oh, you know, you get frustrated, it's not happening fast enough. And that's a, almost a yeah. curse of entrepreneurialism, I think. So, and there's, there's two sides to that. There's positives and negatives. There's always a balance, isn't there? But I think that, that aspect of actually having a long-term vision and being patient and just keep going um, is, is wise advice, actually. Because I think what I see a lot is very often that people tend to overestimate what they can achieve in the short term and underestimate what they can achieve in the long term. Um, And actually, if you've got that uh, nous about you, that sometimes you just have to let things settle, let it evolve, let it mature, you can really do very well. And I think that combination of approach that you've got is quite unusual, but obviously very, you know, very, very good for you. It's working out well. So I love that aspect. I just want to come back to a couple of points you made actually around, I mean, you, you name some really well-known personalities in the travel industry, you know, Harry Goodman, Paul Griffiths, and obviously Richard Branson is someone that's not known just in the travel world, but in the, you know, the business world overall. And, um, And obviously those guys must have inspired you. And I'm fascinated by, I guess, the impact that having great role models, mentors in your life can absolutely make a huge difference to how you develop as a person. You know, the people, the time you spend with people uh, really does shape who you are. So if you think back to maybe we take Richard, because that's an an example that everyone will, will absolutely know. How do you think working with Richard so closely influenced you, helped you grow, helped you develop as a business person and as, and as, a, and as a man as well, you know, a family man? I think um, the thing about Richard, working with Richard closely is, uh, well, there's so many things, but I, 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 he instilled great confidence in me um, at a very young time in, in my career. And when I look back and, uh, how inexperienced I was, but the level of responsibility I had, it, it, it's almost quite scary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but um, that, there's a great thing about Richard. He, he, had, he, he, gave, he gave confidence. He had confidence in, in, in people. Um, he had confidence that businesses were going to uh, succeed against all the odds. You know, the thing about Richard was he believed the impossible was possible. Um, I mean, I don't have his superpowers. Um, there are not many people that do. I don't have that level of belief that he has, but but it, it really, really helped me um, and, and, and gave me confidence. I think the other thing about Richard is, if you, you got to know him quite well, um, is, you know, like all of us, you know, he's not perfect and, and he's... This does sound really surprising, but Rich is quite a shy person. He's quite introverted. Um, and no one would believe that if, if you see him on TV and stuff. Um, he knows how important self-promotion is, and that's why he does it. But he's actually, when, when you meet him face-to-face and stuff, he's actually quite a, quite a shy person. Um, it, it's, 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 really, it's really fascinating, and, and you know, he's... He, he, he's not completely, he's not rounded at all. He's quite an unbalanced person. Um, 
But I think that's why he's been successful because he's just so amazing at certain things. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting point, actually, in that you make, because at the end of the day, perfect doesn't exist. We are all beautifully flawed, <laughs> I always yeah. think. Um, but interestingly, because I think what you've just said there around what the outward perception may be for someone that doesn't say no Richard or, or other people, actually, that, you, you know, you, you see someone and you see them maybe on stage or doing a presentation or whatever. You must say, God, they've got it. so They're so confident. They've got it all covered. Oh, my gosh. You know. But the reality is that inside we all have our demons, our gremlins, our insecurities, yeah. self-beliefs that we tell ourselves. But I think coming back to your point of, of Richard probably being an introvert, but actually managing himself in terms of how he externally shows up. So it's not necessarily about being disingenuous and being pretending to be something you're not. But I think that's very encouraging for people listening, because sometimes I think people think you have to be the extrovert to be yeah. out there leading a business, whether it's in a big corporate world or as an entrepreneur, whatever. And actually, it's very comforting to realize that, no, you don't have to be an extrovert to be the front person. You can just be yourself. Yeah. So it'd be good to get your thoughts on that. And, and how would you see yourself, Ian? Do you, would you say you're an introvert, an extrovert? What's your natural style? And how does that show up for you when you're you're running your businesses? Oh, I'm definitely not an introvert, Jeanette. <laughs> I didn't expect it, but I didn't want to put words in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm a people person. Uh, I, lo- I, love, I love people. Um, I... Uh, you know, it, it, what is it that that uh, that term? It re- really gets me wound up. People say, "Oh, networking, that's not working." Um, and uh, <laughs> as you know, that people used to say that and accuse that to me sometimes. Uh, you know, you just think, "No, you've got no idea." You know, your contacts, your network is so important in business. Never underestimate that. Yeah. Um, so I, I think. At, at, at my core, strip me down. Um, I, I'm a people person, so I love working with with people. I love socialising. Um, I, I draw on my network um, a lot in terms of helping businesses. That's really important. And I think I'm at heart. I'm a commercial person as well. So um, mm. you know, I, 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 I like to see what what do I get a buzz out of? I get a buzz out of seeing you know sales figures every day and you know in the business I'm involved in um you know see seeing businesses grow um I get a buzz out of analyzing margins that you know stuff like that excites me mm. so I'm, I'm I'm commercial and I'm people yeah no that's great and, and very self-aware actually of, of what, what where your skills lie and what you enjoy doing you know and uh, I think sometimes very often we almost work on our weaknesses and think we've got to plug the gap. Well, okay, fine. You always want to improve and develop, but sometimes actually do the things you love, get other people to do the stuff that isn't really your, your bag, because actually they're better at it than you anyway. And, you know, as entrepreneurs, I think it's, it's important to recognize what you're good at and what your, where your skills are and then bring other people in because you can't do it all yourself. Can you? (laughs) And if only I'd have known that, and if only it hadn't taken me 20 years to learn that, Jeanette. (laughs) <laughs> but you learn it now that's the main thing and you live and breathe it every day so that's always learning always, always learning. learning and let's actually that, that that's a really great point Ian so I want to come back to failure right uh, and you've given some really good examples when you were talking us through kind of your career and, and uh, you know sort of uh, life today you talked about Virgin Sun being probably the biggest failure initially at which was emotional as well, because you pour your heart and soul into getting that business up. You had a great opportunity. The brand, you've got Richard behind you, so the pressure as well of all that, even in a nice way, is still pressure. Um, so when that didn't work out, that business, how did you deal with that? And what advice would you give to anyone that's listening in terms of some tools and tricks, how to deal with failure and to actually use it in a positive way to push you forward? Yeah, so um, I, I, th- I think that uh, I, I think you have to I think you have to deal with it, and you have to sort of, to some extent you you have to take some of these things on the chin. And um, up until that point in time, I thought you know I was pretty damn good at what I did, and I thought I was pretty successful. But actually, that was um, a, a, a good kind of reflection point to look and say actually, you know. 
things can go wrong sometimes. You know, you haven't got the Midas touch and, you know, you, you need to be balanced a, a, about these things. I think the the younger you are in life, uh, if you have a few knockbacks and you can recover, I think when you're younger, you can recover quicker and you've got more sort of self-confidence. Um, and thankfully, you know, Richard still believed in me and he gave me another chance mm. with another job. So that was that was really important. I think, you know, what... Um, what Richard Branson does actually is he, um, he, Richard's had loads of failures. I mean, what people don't realize are, um, you know, there's probably about 200, 300 virgin companies out there or has been. Um, he's put his name on so many different businesses and di different business models. Most of them haven't been successful. Um, but um, that doesn't matter because he's had enough ones that have been successful and they've been massively successful. And his view is, um, his view is that, you know, he is, you know, I've sat around the table with, with him and you, you know, talk about the new business opportunities and, you know, here's an option to do, you know, I think it was Virgin Brides, you know, and it was, well, why would we do that? And he, he wanted to do it because he just loved the kind of juxtaposition <laughs> Of the brides versus the virgin name and that literally that was you know the driving thing behind it not not any business plan or business you know that's kind of the way he wanted to do it and he didn't care and it was happening and god knows if it still exists it probably doesn't and it certainly wasn't particularly successful but it didn't matter um to him so i think sometimes um we shouldn't talk, talk about failure we should talk about things being less successful yeah um, and I, uh, I mean, put me personally, I hate failure. Um, and it's something that drives me. So that kind of playing the long game, I guess for me really, Jeanette is not wanting to fail and hanging and, and wanting to, to hold on in there for an opportunity yeah. might come in the future so it can come back and rebound because I, I, I don't like failure. So, um, yeah, it definitely, it definitely motivates me. Yeah, and, and I guess, you know, there's a perspective, isn't there, that says you only ever fail if you give up. Now, that doesn't that doesn't mean to say you flog a dead horse. You know, if a no. business is, is just not working or something yeah. is not the right thing, fail fast and fa but fail forward, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the key, I always think. And it, but it is an interesting thing because I think to recover from failure is so important. I think when people get knocked down, they often make themselves feel like they are the failure as a person. Yeah. And it's not the case. It's that the idea or the role almost, you might have failed in that role or in that business or that initiative or whatever it was, but that does not make you as a person a failure. And I think sometimes people confuse the two. Um, and then that can be really quite damaging. But you're absolutely right. If you can frame it as you've just described, it's incredibly powerful and it just keeps you moving forward in a different way, right? Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, 100%. And um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the, I guess, the lifestyle that you've created for yourself, Ian, through this incredible journey that you've had. I mean, you know, your, your career has been so varied, ups, downs, entrepreneurial startups, corporate, uh, you know, you've, you've really got a fantastic mix in there. And of course, not just travel, you know, you, you've invested in property, you've got the recruitment business. So, you know, you're not just travel, there's a lot more to you than, than that. So, so where you are today, you've got, mul you've got multiple interests, haven't you? But you still um, have created a really nice lifestyle for yourself. So can we just talk about um, is there a balance between does does is there a, does does that exist uh, work life balance is it all a nonsense um, can, you know and just sort of how that plays out for you really and I, I think that's a fascinating area. So um, I, I'd like to be really kind of clever and smart here and say that you know I'm I'm very disciplined um, about how I divide my time etc. Um, but, but that would be a lie. Um, I'm not particularly disciplined or organized person. Um, I think that, um, generally speaking, I, I enjoy what I do. You know, I, I predominantly work in and around the travel industry, um, which has been apart from the last year has been a fantastic, amazing industry to work in. 
Um, it may not have the margins that other industry sectors have, uh, but it has wonderful people and we have a great time. Um, we've got to travel all around the world um, as being part of the travel industry. And I've made some wonderful friends um, and wonderful relationships. And, and that's probably the overriding, overarching factor for me. I think um, success doesn't have to be about how, how many millions of pounds you make in a deal or how profitable your business is or what, you know, margin percentage you're making. Mm. Um, if it's all just about business, yes, of course, those things are important. Um, but, but, but it, it, for me, it's, it's about enjoying life. Um, that's, that's the most important thing. And, and I enjoy traveling and I enjoy people and I enjoy, enjoy talking to people um, I, I, I love um, watching businesses grow and being involved in them. So all, all those things are, are really important to me. And I guess it all does get a bit jumbled up, if, if I'm honest. Mm. Uh, but yeah, um, some of my business partners have, have become friends and some of my friends have become business partners. And sometimes we might you know, go away, go and visit someone who's a business partner and we talk business part of the time, but we have fun as well. So it does get a, a, a little bit mixed up um sometimes and and maybe that's that's wrong and maybe probably i should be more disciplined but um but i'm not <laughs> well well i think it's what's right for you isn't it there isn't one formula you know that for success you know some people prefer to have much more of a, a definition between their their work career business and their personal life but i tend to agree with you i think you know if you love what you do and you are genuinely passionate then you you merge your passion with your profession so even though you, you want to be having the down times, actually, you know, you don't necessarily have this distinction between the two. And that's cool. Right. Because if you're loving what you do and to your point, you know, life is too short. Uh, none of us know how long we've got, do we? So you want to actually make sure you're doing something you bloody love <laughs> for sure. You know, I um I, I very foolishly um, invested in a, uh, a startup, um, which was a nightclub um, startup about 10 years ago. Um, it was certainly wasn't the best, one of the best, uh, investments I've ever made. Um, but we had some great fun, um, along the way. And, um, I didn't actually lose any money. Um, I didn't make particularly a lot of money, but I didn't lose any money. And, um, I learned all about the license trade, which is, which is absolutely fascinating. And, um, I, I learned all about nightclubs, which is that, um, you've got an asset, which you own, um, of which you can really only maximise the, the profits and the revenue within sort of three hours on a Friday night and three hours on a Saturday night. Uh, and boy, you've got to sort of throw everything at that to make that work so that it will pay for um, your overheads of, of that property and, and your staff across the rest of the week when it's very difficult to use. Um, uh, but, you know, the reason I share that is is that it was great fun doing it. You know, it, it, it really was. And um, I, I have no regrets whatsoever. Yeah. Listen, I mean, that, that, if you can, if you can claim that you've got no regrets, that is the perfect place to be. It doesn't matter whether you, whatever you do in, in business or life, if you can actually say, I've got no regrets and, and I've given it a go, whatever that dream is, I think that is absolutely the, the place to be, to get to and be. Um, and, you know, and it comes with time, doesn't it? Sometimes, it, you know, you get a little bit older and wiser and, and you, you get a bit more, I think, chilled out about kind of knowing who you are as a person, a bit more comfortable in your own shoes to be able yeah. to, to kind of give those things a go. Um, so if you were just giving some advice, uh, Ian, to someone that maybe wanted to, maybe they're in the corporate world, actually, because I know you work in corporate, but in quite an entrepreneurial space within corporate, but still you understand big business and what that's like um, and wanted to jump out or to create a side hustle, you know, sometimes it's, it's um, more of a transition and become more entrepreneurial, become a business owner. What, what pieces of advice would you give to someone in that position? Yeah, so um, a few things. Um, I'd say timing's quite important. So it, it, it's, is it the right time in your life um, to, to, make, to make that leap, if you're going to make that leap? Um, you know, if, if perhaps if you have young children or a big mortgage or you've got kids in private school, maybe that's not the right time. Um, perhaps if you don't have 
any res- other responsibilities, perhaps that's a good time. Um, perhaps if you've just got made redundant with a big redundancy package, you've, that might be a good time. There's nothing else to lose. Or it might be that you're working in a business and you can see an opportunity and that that bit, that company, whatever's not taken that opportunity, um, mm. that that might be the right time. So um, I, I, I'm a kind of, I'm a believer in, in opportunism. So it's, it's, it's when there's an, when you see that opportunity. Um, I think the second thing is get some good people around you. That's really, really important. Um, some people who've uh, have been there before, some people who can help you, advise you, um, you know, leverage your network. I think that's really important. Um, and I think the other one, which a lot of people, when they, I get a lot of, you know, people pitching ideas and businesses to me. And the one thing that a lot of them don't have and they lack and they miss is, is something differentiating, you know, something that gives them that edge. You see so many Me Too businesses and you're going to go, yeah, it all looks nice and fine, but what's different about that? What, what, where's your edge? You know, find your edge. That's, that's the key thing for me. Yeah, no, that, that is great advice. And, and, and you're right, you know, actually it's timing, having a great idea, having something that's unique um, and, and then your network, that combination is really important, isn't it, Ian? So that, that's fantastic yeah. advice. But also I just think, you know, be brave. I mean, this podcast is called Brave, Bold, Brilliant. You know, if something feels right and you've got, there is an, you know, you want to, of course, have done your numbers and have logically thought things through. But if you've got, if your gut is telling you that some, you want to give something a go, give it a go, you know. And, and I think yeah. also for, for some people, they might feel it's a it's a it's a jump from one thing to another, um, but the, the reality is you never lose all of those great skills and experience that you you've built up all over the years. You can always go back. You know how bad is it going to be if it doesn't work? At least you tried. You know you'll have exactly. learned something. Um, but nothing worse than sitting there thinking what if and looking back saying oh I really wish I'd given it a go because you don't know where it might lead. So I think um, that's brilliant advice for people, Ian. So I'm just going to come to um, advice that you have received from other people, if I may. So can you think of the best piece of advice you've ever been given, Ian? So, um, I mean, this isn't necessarily for for, for everyone. Um, this is just a personal thing. Um, but, you know, when I, the early days at, at Virgin, at Virgin Atlantic, um, and I was just, getting to know Richard Branson. And he said to me one day, he said, Ian, why don't you ditch the suit? You don't need the suit. And um, of course, you know, Richard was famed for sort of being very casual and his, mm. and his jumpers, et cetera. Um, and, and I guess I was, you know, brought up on, you know, at work you wear a suit and people did. And I and I um, I actually hate wearing suits. Um, <laughs> uh, my, my dad worked for a, um, a company called Dun and Co, which is was an old fashioned traditional men's outfitters, and it was you know all about suits and smart clothes, etc. And 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 I hated all of that. I sort of you know I, I didn't want to be dressed all smart. I, I love be casual. So it, it was kind of, but it was actually what I think Rich was saying to me was more than that. He was really saying, be yourself. Don't try and put on a facade uh, and try and pretend you're some, someone that you're not. Be yourself. And I think that um, that was probably the best the best advice. Um, and play to your strengths. Always play to your strengths. And as yeah. you said, find other people to cover up your, to cover your weaknesses. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant advice. As you say, yeah, just, just, you are, you are uniquely you and there is no one better at being you than you, right? <laughs> Have the yeah. confidence with that for sure. That That's brilliant. I love that. And can you think of the worst piece of advice, Ian, you've ever been given? That could be advice that you ignored because it was so bad or that you took and you thought, oh, shouldn't have, done, shouldn't have taken that advice. So I, I don't think that, um, that there is bad advice. Um, and, and I don't think that there is an occasion of, of worse advice. I think what there are are bad choices. And I think that um, it's really important in life and in, particularly in business is to listen to as, as, as much advice as possible, listen to lots of different people's opinions um, and, and f- form your own judgment. Uh, you know, people that blame bad advice 
I think, have to take some responsibility themselves for choosing to take that that advice. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, and, and, you know, don't just rely on one person. Take take advice from a number of people. Yeah, great. No, I agree with that. Absolutely. And the final question, just to wrap up, what does brave, bold, brilliant mean to you, Ian? Well, obviously, um, you know, uh, brave was you for inviting me on here, really. Um, <laughs> Because I'm a bit of a maverick, net. I could have said anything, really. I love it. <laughs> although, although you do have editing uh, control, don't you? So maybe you weren't that brave. Um, this is this is a bit personal to me. I'm going to be serious now for a minute. Um, brave actually uh, relates to to my wife Gail Kenny um, in the past year because um, uh, not only has as like everyone has she had to go through uh, COVID. Um, but she's had to go through uh, COVID um, with, with, with cancer treatment, um, which, which all finished um, last month fantastically, which is great news. Uh, and she's, uh, she's on the mend, but um, she's been incredibly brave. And um, I'm just, you know, she hasn't moaned once and she's just been uh, uh, amazing, absolutely amazing. And um, I'm very proud of her. So that's brave. Uh, bold, I think, is um, anybody out there who's done a startup, who's launched their own business or involved in a startup. Um, it is a very bold thing to do, to put yourself out there and take on the established competition um, and take on the establishment. And, and I love everybody that does that. I, I love people that take on the establishment. Um, good for them. They are bold people. Um, I respect you all. Um, and, and brilliant, I would say, are... Um, there's so many people I've worked with um, over a lot of years. I've worked with some really, really brilliant people. I've mentioned some of them. Um, you know, Paul Griffiths at, at Virgin Atlantic is a brilliant mind, a brilliant, brilliant um, mind. Um, I work with um, a great sales trainer um, called Terry Wiltshire, who all the guys back in the day at Virgin Atlantic will know, sadly no longer with us. He was brilliant. Um, my business partners, John Kent at Med Hotels, was the most brilliant negotiator I've ever worked with in my life. He was absolutely brilliant. He was a nightmare in lots of other respects, um, but he was a br- he was brilliant negotiator and brilliant what he did. Um, and uh, you know, we had some some great fun um, building Med Hotels. Um, I've currently got two brilliant people I work with uh, at Arena Travel. Um, so Steve Goodenough um, and Declan Trainer, who the, the the MD and Chairman of Arena Travel, they are so brilliant and so incredibly bright and and resilient. Um, Chris Foti, who some people in the travel industry may know, um, he's he's been a brilliant advisor to me. He's so knowledgeable about um, regulation in in the travel industry. Um, it's it's just incredible. Um, and uh, you know, there there are some. Some brilliant people at the businesses I'm involved in at the moment at Melt Digital. Some young guys there called Bart, Charlie, uh, Scott, doing some amazing things with machine learning. Um, they're going to be brilliant. Um, you know, uh, the the people that I've met in the last 15 years working with Gail Kenny at Gail Kenny Executive Recruitment, we've met some brilliant candidates. We've we've placed some brilliant people. Um, and, and watching people, you know, develop their careers and go on to be hugely successful, you know, it's it's just great to see. Oh, that's fantastic. So really big shout out for all those fantastic, brilliant people that um, are in your life and have been in your life. So that's a, that's a great way to finish. Thank you so much, Ian. You have been incredibly brave, bold and brilliant yourselves. <laughs> I've got, I got one more shout out, I, which I want to say, and this is this is obviously quite personal, um, but it's actually for my daughter, Natalie. Um, and uh, I think she's brilliant as well. She has um, started a community on Instagram um, for people with dyslexics, and it's called um, Adults with, Dys- with Dyslexia. And she's got nearly 5,000 followers now. And she's holding a torch for people who um, are succeeding in business um, despite having dyslexia. So um, I just want to shout out for her as well. Yeah, wonderful. And also massively helpful for anyone listening. So definitely check check out um, you know that account on Instagram. That's brilliant as well. So thank you so much, Ian. I really appreciate your candidness. You. You've been wonderful. Thank you.